we've made a justification for an evolutionary biologist to not talk about evolutionary biology because it's like insensitive. No, no, no. He's free to talk about it, but I'm also free to scrutinize the implication by which, like, why is he demanding it? This is now the time to bring it up. Well, because people want him to have a conversation a about like race and stuff, right? So wouldn't this be if he was ever going to do it? Like okay. that would be. I think it's a little bit unfair to characterize it as like, oh, people just want to have a discussion about race. Like, That's true. Just... They didn't want to have a discussion about race. They wanted to force white people off the campus using social pressure. I don't see a problem with telling those people, yo, shut the f up. Like, because so, you don't have any interest in actually engaging in a debate. If someone's out there and saying, I trans people should be genocided, and you shoot that person, and you take that person off the face of the earth, I don't think that's inherently a bad thing. My name is Aaron, and I am here to debate if wokeness has gone too far or not. Okay, my earlier uh, undefeated conversation topic was that wokeness has obviously gone too far because I think progressives- Obviously. Obviously. Okay. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> obviously wokeness has gone too far because progressives are really bad at engaging other people in conversation topics. I think that there, like, there's like way too much of like a ideological orthodoxy that's like enforced around like any area that progressives get their hands on. Go. Okay, so I'm less interested in making any sort of, I guess like, positive argument i'm just going to say that i think the the you're po you're basically the one putting forward the positive argument that True. Like, this has gone too far i'm not even going to make any prescriptions as to that i'm just going to say i think that premise is entirely false um and the biggest problem that i have with this conversation is that what can you concretely define what you mean by wokeness um yeah so i think that progressives through a lot of arguments surrounding have you ever heard of the paradox of tolerance Yes, that if you're too tolerant of intolerance, you're going to create a society like Nazi Germany because you're going to let it be overrun by people who would take advantage of that. Exactly. That through that argument of the paradox of tolerance, pro um, progressives have essentially created the system that allows them to get rid of all dissenting opinion because the dissenting opinions themselves represent like a threat to discourse or democracy or woke values or whatever. Okay, That's like the specific thing I'm kind of like pointing out. Okay, can you give me an example of like wokeness run amok that you think is problematic or if it were to be become a, like a broader social trend would mm -hmm. be some sort of social contagion yeah so sure so some of the things that i was kind of looking at earlier so on the macro level it's like the rigid enforcement of like progressive values and if there's any deviation you get bucked by the system or you get like you know excise or whatever um for micro examples um i would say that brett weinstein at evergreen college was an example of this can i stop you what do you mean by bucked by the system like you're like so if you're in school people will try to like cancel you or get you kicked out if you're like a faculty or administrator people ask for your resignation or make it hard for you to work if you're a researcher people won't want to work with you or publish your stuff like stuff like that okay so like threats to livelihood is, is, is yeah what basically you're yeah a oh. lot like lots of cultural pressure lots of social pressure sometimes direct like pressure from staff but lots okay. of social and cultural pressure okay and then um, so like I think Brett Weinstein at like Evergreen College was like a pretty good example of that okay why? Um, where I think Brett's arguments were, even if you disagreed with them, I think they were entirely reasonable. What and were I, his arguments? Um, he felt like, are you familiar with the Evergreen College situation? Yes, I am, but I'm interested in hearing your characterization of it. So why don't you explain it? Oh, that's cool. it up. Okay. okay. I learned all about it in the Red Pill community, shit tests and everything. So that's okay, good. Nice. Okay, Sounds yeah. good. Tell me Okay, about yeah. It. So my understanding was that traditionally at this school, there were days, or there was like one day a year where... I think it was specifically black students would take a step back and let everybody have like a day and see like, well, this is what it's like when minorities are missing and then they do like a off-campus event or something. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to switch it up where they were saying, well, we're gonna ask white students to leave or white faculty or white people to leave college this day for, I don't even know what the justification given there was, but I think Brett sent out an email where he was disagreeing and he was saying like, I think it's a bit different when you're asking white people to leave. I don't agree with this. I don't wanna partake in this. And through that email being published and then disseminated to the student body, people got this idea that there were a lot of ideas, but basically people started to show up at his class outside. They were, I don't know if I say threatening him, but they were like screaming at him, shouting at him. They really wanted to fight over him being like racist and stuff like that. And eventually it blew into a thing where, I don't know if he ended up settling with the college before he left or whatever, but he mm -hmm. basically left the college because of all the pressure. Yeah, I know about this, unfortunately, because he has taken himself on a media parade yes. and will go on to any podcast that will let him rehash the story, even though it literally happened forever ago. Yep. Um, do you know what the contents of those emails were that he said in response to his disagreement to the, like, they free of white people mm -hmm. on campus or whatever? Um, yeah, we actually, I, re I read all of them, I think a couple months ago, again, because okay. we wrote it up, but I don't remember, I can't recite it word for word. Okay, I can't either, but I do remember that what he did say to this organizer was that he would be happy to provide a... A forum for discussion or something, I think, or... Yes, do you know what the topic was going to be? Um, what was the topic? I don't remember race and how it coincides with evolutionary like, oh okay psych. gotcha 
Okay, so he was basically going to, he, he was interested in exploring like race realism. Okay. He's an evolutionary biologist. It's an appropriate topic to explore, right? Right. But given the context of why he's bringing up that he was interested in exploring that subject, when the controversy um, has to do with, um, I guess, disagreement about social justice strategies or whatever, like, what do you think the implication is when he's like, I would be happy to educate people on race realism? Um, I think it's literally perfect. It's within his wheelhouse of what he's educated to do. If you like, one of my biggest frustrations as like an online debater content creator is people like me end up getting tasked with debating these like esoteric or very difficult to navigate scientific fields and nobody from those scientific disciplines will ever enter into any of these discussions to give their opinions. So if somebody that actually has a background in the field wants to like enter into that field and give a discussion on race realism, me personally, I'd rather somebody like, well, I don't know now, but back then, Brett Weinstein talking about um, race realism and evolutionary psychology i'd prefer that to like you know nick fuentes or somebody talking about it oh it's a pretty low bar to clear i'd hope that it was maybe a little bit higher but okay that's well I, I mean jordan P uh, i'd prefer him to like ben shapiro talking about it i guess yeah another low standard all right so well, it's conservatives the standard's not very high okay i'm trying okay. my best here all right so but i don't i mean like do you think that like no offense to Brett, or take offense, I don't want Brett to do like a workshop on like, let's talk about like the systemic injustice that appears in society and how we can like alleviate some of the pressures that minorities feel in like America. Like he's an evolutionary biologist. What is he going to say to that? Like, that's just like a virtue signal. Like, oh, let's like, I brought a slideshow from YouTube. I know, but like, I think that there's something in between this huge virtue signal and then ramping it all the way up to like, I'd be interested in discussing race realism with you and the idea that there may or may not be superior racial genes, even though that's junk science. To me, well, it's, no, it's no different than if he had brought up, um, oh, what is it when they like, like skull shapes? Phrenology. Phrenology. If he said, I would be happy, to, I'm like, I'm not happy to participate in this like um, anti-racism exercise, whether or not it's good is subjective obviously um and you can have his disagreements with that but then to follow that up with but i would be happy to discuss um what did you just say it was phrenology phrenology well but the phrenology with, is by definition my, black of, students of this yeah okay. sure phrenology is a bunk science but like look, look at where we're at now okay i'm glad you picked this topic because it illustrates my point perfectly right? okay perfect We've made a justification for an evolutionary biologist to not talk about evolutionary biology because it's, like, insensitive. No, no, no. He's free to talk about it. But I'm also free to scrutinize the implication by which, like, why is he demanding that this is now the time to bring it up? Well, because people want him to have a conversation a about, like, race and stuff, right? So wouldn't this be, if he was ever going to do it, like, okay. that would be... I think it's a little bit unfair to characterize it as, like, oh, people just want to have a discussion about race. Like, That's true. Just... They didn't want to have a discussion about race. They wanted to force white people off the campus using social pressure for Right, and reasons. I'm I'm not even going to defend that or... or discuss mm -hmm. it or whatever but i think it, like the situation is a little bit more nuanced than oh he wasn't allowed to, you know he well, like he got fired or like whatever i don't think he, he actually was... got fired i think he ended up settling with the school and leaving with some payoff package but it was obviously everybody wanted to leave the yeah, students exactly. and i think the like, faculty as well people but... think that it starts and ends with like oh they you know and he, he talked about this like i listened to his interview on joe rogan where he said that you know he is a jewish man and he is uncomfortable being told that within a country that he wants to live in there are spaces that he is not welcome in because it's happened historically to jewish people which is a completely defensible point what is indefensible to me and what he conveniently leaves out is not only did he voice his disagreement which is completely fine you can we can argue and disagree about like which strategies about um anti-racism and social justice um, are best and appropriate um the umbrage i thought people were taking up with him was that he was saying oh but i would be happy to give a lecture on race realism which is essentially the tr like the new version of well, but hold on, what did like, you think he was going to say was he going to say like welcome today we're going to study the warrior gene and why black people are predisposed like did you really think that was going to be like his presentation like we don't even know what the presentation would have been what I know it would have been very interesting to hear all about. But we never you know, got to race, hear it. Race realism. Is it well, we can, there are things you can talk about for like I'm sure as an evolutionary biologist, you have something to say. But do Maybe you his whole presentation. Think that what? he was sad that he didn't get to give that presentation. Do you think that he was really making that that offer to give that lecture? Because it sounded like the offer would have been people. that like if you want to have a day where we discuss issues that are relevant to minorities, here is an issue that I can discuss that's relevant to my particular scientific discipline, which yeah. I think is what would make the, the most sense. The study of how they're inferior to white genes. How do you know that's what he was going to say? Maybe he's going to say black people were superior. Yeah, maybe he was. Maybe we were deprived of an excellent lecture where he made that exact point. You Regardless, know? it's a college campus. Isn't this like where those types of conversations should be happening with an actual evolutionary biologist rather than like whatever your local conservative group is or your local YouTuber? I agree with that entirely, but well, then, my what's only the pro then what do you disagree with? My disagreement is that that doesn't meet the threshold to say that it's gone out of control. What you just went on to describe 
you know, ex an excessive detail because he mm -hmm. will not ever stop like telling the story. Well, I described um, it because you asked me for one example. That's one example. We go through plenty others if you want. <laughs> I know. That was the only thing, but. But I think you and your audience know all too well that anecdotes, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> data is not just the plural. Like, sure. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, data is not the plural of anecdote. I understand. But right. when you start to get like story after story after story after story, is that story some after of which story, though? it is story after story. So, like, one of the most recent really troubling ones, I'll do this last one and then we'll let the other guy jump on, um, and I'll let you respond to this. One of the most recent troubling ones to me, very troubling, very upsetting, was there was a study that was promoted, I think it was conducted at and then promoted by the University of Washington. And this was a study showing that puberty blockers were incredibly beneficial to minors when they were prescribed and they checked for suicidality after the fact. Okay. And when they did this study, the university was shouting it from the rooftops, this is so great, we're helping trans kids, puberty blockers are amazing. People went back and they dug through the study and they're like, uh, okay, well, when you actually look at it, it's actually a wash. It doesn't really help suicidality much at all. Like it's like it a hormone wash? Um, stop. No, it doesn't help much at all, okay? We're not doing that. Okay. Um, but, the, um, but when the university found this out, when they were, um, internal emails got leaked mm -hmm. when this was brought up and they were like, okay, well, actually, it looks like this wasn't true at all, but we're not going to really talk about it publicly because people were so happy with the last headlines, it would be kind of shitty to announce now that it didn't actually do much at all. This was like verbatim, not verbatim, but this is more or less what the contents of the email were. Okay. And it's like, holy shit, well, now we're actually talking about like scientific literature being published and promoted, and now we're talking about picking and choosing which scientific literature we want to promote based on the social agenda that it promotes. That's really scary to me. And there are more anecdotes, but go for it. I'll let you respond to that one. Okay, like, I'm not even going to disagree that, like, any, you can throw these anecdotes at me all day, but they will always just be that. They will just be anecdotes. Like, are we actually seeing a meaningful trend? And I don't, and I mean beyond the scope of individual people having their livelihoods disrupted, um, losing their income or whatever. Honestly, for the most part, I would disagree, or, like, I would agree with you that, like, in each, like, discrete example that you're going to bring up, there were inappropriate measures that were taken to HR to get them removed from some, some campus where somebody should have been able to speak where they weren't able to. But I'm saying, can you see this borne out in any sort of meaningful policy that's been well, I mean, instituted at a, uh, even at a municipal level or possibly state or federal? And I just don't think it's ever met that threshold. And I think that alone kind of negates your entire premise that it's gone too far because we would see it happening in Congress, happening in state um, legislatures, happening you know, well, Congress is federal, um, or at the Supreme Court, that because wokeness has gone amok, you know, we must make these corrective policy measures that could potentially, you know, do more harm than good. Um, and I guess that's mostly what I'm worried about, like the policy implications of saying that like, okay, even if wokeness has gone too far, um, fine, like for the sake of the argument, I'll concede like it has gone too far, like what, what do we do about it? Cut the bother. Okay. Oh, did you ask me what I do? Oh, I said I give you the last word. Um, well, I, I understand that it's not there, like, in policy positions, um, but in schools and in the response to what's happening in schools, it does seem to be there. Now, for whatever reason, progressives are really bad at getting people elected and getting their will enacted in Congress, mm -hmm. but I think across, like, college campuses, like, when you look at, like, man, what was the last place? Like, the ideological leanings of, like, professors and stuff, it's, like, f***ing, like, 85% left. And, like, even some of the econ departments, somebody, I don't know if it's true here for uh, University of Texas. But is that a problem? Um, Should we be hiring professors based off of their partisan affiliation? Shouldn't it be based off their expertise in the subject, how well they are at lecturing? Yeah, it should be, but you just told me that somebody with the expertise in evolution or biology couldn't talk about it because it was racially insensitive. No, I did say that so, he was fine to talk about it, but I was saying we should. it's interesting also to explore the implication of why he decided that that was the appropriate moment to give that particular No, lecture. no, I understand, but I'm saying that, like, when, when, I'm not saying we should hire people based on their ideological proclivities. Mm, it sounded but when, like it. When you're, no, it didn't. You just heard that because you wanted to hear that. Oh, okay. But uh, if, if you're getting this huge slant in a certain direction, the question is, like, well, are all well, how do you know that that, that partisan well, slant? Point. The question is, are all of these people, do they just happen to be left-leaning? Or is there like a culture that's kind of developing that encourages only left-leaning people to participate? Or people that aren't left-leaning to kind of like hush their opinion about it? You that's say, oh, point. is there a culture? No, no, no. I think you firmly decided that well, like, no, there, there, obviously there definitely is, of course. is a culture. There obviously okay? is a culture. There is this liberal orthodoxy that's being enforced within academia or whatever. Progressive orthodoxy. Oh, okay. Um, aren't you a progressive yourself? Yes. But I don't enforce a progressive orthodoxy. That's why I'm here at the University of Texas talking to kids. But are you sure that that's really the progressive orthodoxy? What for what? What the, like if you if you went up to the majority of progressives and you gave all of these examples, do you think they would wholesale start endorsing like any of the repercussions that happen in all of these like awful anecdotes that you're giving? Yes. Where somebody's like you're you're positive so. on that? Okay, uh, just like wholesale 50, disagree on over that. Over fifty-one percent. Yes. You would be able to find plenty of liberal and left-leaning people who would be able to condemn any sort of actions that were taken like I yeah know there probably would be some but i think that over half of like progressives would be in favor of like like viciously getting rid of like certain types of thoughts that they feel like don't belong on college campuses at all like what types of thoughts like like, uh, like 
And how would you even like eliminate these thoughts? How would these progressive Well, you do it through social campus. culture pressure, right? And are they not allowed to do that? I don't think they should on college campuses, no. Enforce like a because I think that a college campus should represent. This is what like, I mean. It's like wokeness just ends up turning well, wait, into. Wait, like, I'm answering wokeness, specifically. You're not letting me respond to your questions. Wokeness is anything I just I don't like. No, that's not true. Okay, what I'm saying is that like I think that on college campuses there should be like a diversity of thought, right? I should be able to find on a college campus like the local fascist squad like talking about fascism, and if I don't like what they have to say, I should be able to ask like my political science teacher like, hey, that's these what people those progressives are doing. No, they're not. What they're saying is we need to protest, boycott them, and get them kicked off campus so that in our own poly sci classes we can. Start Trick about how ideologically pure and cool we are without ever having to address an uncomfortable thought or okay, deal with at, trans at thought that are hard to... what point do your criticisms of the, like, you know, your, your local um, white pride group, fascist group, start, in your opinion, going too far? Mm -hmm. Like, you can only criticize them up to a certain point before you're like, hey, you're heading into territory where you're, like, your wokeness greed. Yeah, is, I think the is, issue is like, when you're not... Odds with other people's rights. Yeah, when you refuse to platform it at all, I think that's an issue because then people don't even know how to engage with those different strains of thought. I know, but you know who's, who was proposing stuff like this? It was liberals, not not progressives. Like, back in 2019, during the presidential um, campaigns, Kamala Harris was the one who was going up on the debate stage and saying that she was making it a, like, a policy promise, that she believed that Trump should be banned off Twitter. This was back in 2019. Kamala Harris is a progressive, not a liberal, though. What? She was like Medicare for all. She was way to the left of Biden. She absolutely was. She was. She was. But is she now? No, you know she was, fell in you line know because Biden with, is a you boss. You know who's disagreeing with her? What? The other progressive on the stage, Elizabeth Warren. Good. And now look where she is. <laughs> and where is that? <laughs> Not where Biden is. <laughs> or Kamala Harris. Okay, final word, go. Final word? I told you I'm not here to make any sort of... like. Well, just give us a final thought. I got to people on it. You give your your final thoughts first, okay? Um, dealer, dealer my final first. thought is it's, it's hard to quantify, like, because people will ask, Maybe like, well, how do Maybe because it doesn't you... exist. No. <laughs> it's hard to quantify, like, because people say, like, show me, like, a poll or show me a thing of, like, why... Yes, people ask for evidence. They ask me for these inconvenient things like citations for the assertions that I'm making where, you know, you have to actually prove that, you know, the empirical claims that you're making. You're doing it right I now. You're, you're not giving me a chance to speak. You're I'm not. Me. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Go for it. I think that you can see a huge trend both in the ideas and stuff that get passed around and enforced socially in college campuses among faculty and staff, where you're getting okay. more and more people that are complaining about, hey, I didn't fit the progressive orthodox here, so I quit. Some There was an anthropology department where people are complaining about this. I wish I could remember the school. I should remember. There was that University of Washington thing. There was stuff that happened in the Oberlin stuff where they were like racist against the bakery for arresting a black person. You have the um, the Brett Weinstein stuff. There's like story after story after story. And I, I acknowledge they are just stories. But like at some point, when not only are these stories becoming more frequent, when it gets support and mass by progressives, because you do see them generally across social media where we can quantify it, supporting these stories and mass, like, I, I don't know what piece of evidence you would need to see, like, oh, okay, maybe this is like a problem that we should start to worry about. No, I do think that those individual instances are problems that have to be dealt with, but we already have the tools to deal with them. We have, like, um, you can appeal. You can appeal uh, to your department chair if you're within academia. You can go to HR. You can file um, wrongful termination lawsuits. Like we, we have the courts. Like there are yeah. avenues for dealing with these things, and all of them are available to these people. Like you know, I, I would honestly say that like Weinstein's life is is has only been made better by that because he's now like a millionaire like he just grips off this entire thing he'll never stop it was it was excellent for him you know like on principle like i would disagree with him but it was only to his benefit like you think he's like has he truly been silenced like i heard more about this man after that happened than before it before he was a nobody yeah for certain people they could benefit from it but for the overwhelming amount of people it's a negative thing there are certain huge people that can benefit from like being canceled because they've got like the platform they get like all the no, media but he was here. that person because he was a nobody before that right or was he um, yeah but he managed professor? to spin it off into like a media career but most people that get canceled like don't benefit from it you agree with that right yeah but like how many that's like the problem is like 99 like, of people that get hardcore canceled don't benefit from it there are a few that manage to spin it off into something successful but when you say like most people who get canceled though like are you making the assumption that like most people are like working class people and this is happening within like people on social media that are getting like canceled people and college teachers that are tenure that are getting canceled um any like you know. do you think social media is indicative of like the views of your average american don't you think it's i think it's becoming skewed? more and more in line with the views of the average american yes okay like 
all empirical research like runs contrary to the assertion that you just made. Like even if okay, hold on, those... no, that is not true. One second. The empirical mm, okay. research says that Twitter tends to be more white, more affluent, and more young than the American demographic. But research will not tell you that opinions on Twitter don't represent the opinions of any Americans at all. There is a divergence, of course, but the opinions of online I never said people. That they don't represent hold on. The opinions any of online people of 15 years ago Americans. on the internet were crazy, not resembling real life people. Nobody went to the internet in 2002 to find out like what do Americans think about X, Y, Z. But nowadays with social media, whose explicit goal is to connect as many people as possible across like political paradigms, of course you're going to see like Twitter today in 2022 is going to represent more American opinion than a GeoCities website in 1998. Why is that? Because more and more people are connected to the internet today. I think only 35% of Americans are on Twitter. And then of that 35, I think it's something that like 25% of users or like a, a vast minority of users, users actually account for the vast, like 97% of tweets. Probably, so yeah. we're, we're truly def like definitely one of those. talking about, yeah, we know that, um, like a vocal minority here. Sure, it is still a vocal minority, but it's becoming more and more of a majority, right? Like 15 right? years ago, my mom would have never said that she gets like news on Facebook. Today, she gets her news exclusively on Facebook. And I think it's something like 65 or 70% of Americans say they get the majority of their news from social media. Aren't so they might not be telling your, on yourself a little bit by saying like, like my mom or like citing like a personal example, kind of like, sh you know, okay, well, showing. I, well, I like to do the one, two. So the first was my mom. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second. I so the second would be, I'm pretty sure that like the most recent poll that I've heard is, is like it's between 65 and 70% of Americans' primary news source is social media. Like, it's such a huge deal. You've got Facebook talking about, like, Cambridge Analytica and stuff in front of Congress. You've got Congress constantly asking questions of, like, how do we deal with misinformation online? You've got some yeah, people that Biden would assert even... that maybe, you're, you're like, on one breath, you're telling me, like, well, social media, does it really represent much? And then on the other no, hand, you've got people you, saying, you. on the other hand, you've got people saying that, like, Russian interference in uh, different social media platforms was so important. It might have been the tipping point for the election um, mm -hmm. in 2016. So, I mean, it seems like it probably matters. Oh, it do I'm not saying that it doesn't matter, but I'm saying, like, to what degree is it indicative and, like, reflective of, you know, your average American voter? Because, like you're saying, your average American, um, like, most people who vote, right, are are they wealthy or, like, what, what economic well, Your voting population probably skews older, wealthier, whiter, mm -hmm. would be my guess. Right, okay. Who makes up, like, whoa. Are we good? Yeah, go for it. Okay, like rich people almost by definition, we're talking about like a minority of, yep. of people, right? So like the vast majority of this country is like working class, right? Okay. And you're already saying like, you already can see that like Twitter skews affluent, skews white, skews rich, skews um, educated. Yep. Okay, like that's like not the voting the, population. That, that's not the, I know, but that's who's voting. I'm talking about all Americans, not just voting Americans. Okay, well, what, I mean, so all Americans, like Americans that are nine national... years old or what? Huh? <laughs> like nine-year-old Americans or what? What I don't know it's your it's your topic, but like um, I would say like for for the sake of this like Americans over the age of like sixteen maybe eighteen, you know. I think social media is giving us more indicative views of like what they think as time goes on. I would say you're but just wrong. Okay, I'm not wrong. So but. <laughs> okay, here final thing and then because no, I got no, no, so yeah, my go. final thing is that you say you're like a pretty big like free market guy, right? Yeah. Okay, so maybe we can find some common ground here. All right. I don't think you have any sort of meaningful policy prescription that you could put forward to deal with, you know, the supposed overabundance of wokeness that's occurring on college campuses and, you know, in your house, uh, just your workplace, like anywhere. Um, but like, okay, like this is the, the common ground is like maybe to introduce like antitrust because what you're complaining about is like capitalism to me. You're complaining about uh, just actors within a free market who are navigating that to their benefit and for profit. So, like, for example, Joe Biden, uh, I think within the last year, made the statement and then walked it back that, face, like, quote, practically, Facebook is killing people because of COVID misinformation, because of vaccine disinformation that was being disseminated among social media. And he backed off that um, pretty quickly even though the first take was the base take. COVID, Facebook absolutely is killing people because they were promoting misinformation. They were promoting um, conspiracy theorists, people like Alex Jones, you know, and what the, the question is like, okay, if that's happened, what are we going to do about it? Okay. And Joe Biden backed off that statement because he has no solution to it because it, his entire neoliberal ideology is, in, like, is predicated upon making sure that these actors within the free market who have a coercive power that he doesn't like um, be allowed to do as they please, you know? And at this point, they control probably several percentage points of web traffic. And 
what are we going to do about that? He backed off of it because he's, he's not about to say, oh, well, we're going to break up Facebook into a million pieces until it's no longer profitable for these individual bad actors to spread disinformation um, because he's not going to regulate them like yeah, that. Yeah, I agree. And my goal isn't generally to function like from the government. I think like socially we should pressure people to not be as big on like the cancel stuff. That's kind of what I push on. But what's the point of... Of having this like or like I guess this principle, if you're not going to actually try to institute it into policy, and because it doesn't to, have to, be, you, we can have social pressure that isn't like dating norms aren't. So like, you're talking about just culture war. Yep. You're not interested. I'm a YouTuber. That's what I talk about. Yeah, we know. Um, but then what's the point? All you're doing is complaining that people don't agree with you. Yeah, getting people to change their mind. It's the point of doing events like this. Ah uh, yes. Was your mind changed? No, nope, but I hope yours was. Okay. <laughs> what's your name? Uh, you can call me X. X. No, no slave names here. No slave names here. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> so, yeah, what do you what do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Or do you want to start? Uh, I mean, I guess I'm confused as to why you're taking the the terminally online definition of wokeness so much. It's like the way you're presenting wokeness, mm -hmm. I feel, comes from like all these dudes who get their political information from fucking memes. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I don't think that's what wokeness is. Sure. That being said, now I think there's nothing wrong, inherently wrong with canceling people for saying stupid ass shit. You know what I'm saying? Gotcha. Like if someone says, if, if Yeezy's out there saying, I hate Jewish people and we're canceling him, is that being too woke? Um, the, uh, the yay stuff is <laughs> it's very complicated. That's a very but that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like in well, my let's, mind, let's, the, that's where it it, it goes. Mm -hmm. Is all these people want to say hateful stuff? Sure, right? They want to so say like I don't like black people. I don't like mm -hmm. women. And then they kind of we, we, you like to use the term dog whistling, right? Mm -hmm. But they say a little more subtly, and then they get canceled and they cry. Oh no, I, I'm not, my, my free speech is being suppressed. It's like, mm -hmm. no, you're just being an asshole. Like, so here's, yeah, so let's, so taking apart some of the things you said earlier. So the first thing you said, you mentioned like the terminally online thing for people that get political information from memes. Um, do you know anything about my background or would I do anything? Uh, a little bit, like I watch you occasionally. Okay, more that's fine. Recently, I'm just curious, but, just so I know. Yeah. So, like five or six years ago, um, I used to be at a debate against a lot of conservatives, alt writers, um, centrist people that were really like right people masquerading as centrists, right? For sure, for um, sure. And oftentimes, the argument that I would use is like, you are attacking and you know vilifying and and going crazy about these opinions online that like nobody really believes in. You know, you've got like YouTube videos with like 20 million views attacking a, a tweet with like four likes. There's like no reason to do this. It seems really silly. But it seems like a couple things have happened. Over time, the online stuff has gotten a lot more popular, and also the online stuff is like permeating into real life more. So for instance, you made that reference earlier to like, um, it feels like you're arguing it's people to get all their news from memes. And I would agree that I am, but it feels like, um, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 33. When I grew up, my parents constantly told me, uh, don't get information from the internet, don't trust anything you read on the internet. In school, we weren't allowed to use the internet as a resource, and they told us that constantly. And now my parents get their news exclusively from Facebook memes, um, such that they don't even watch Fox News anymore. Uh, and I want to say the recent polling in that was like 64% of Americans get their news from Facebook. So insofar as we're addressing people that get their news from memes, is it sad? Yeah, but I think it's actually become the majority of Americans that get their news from memes or comedy-like material, you know? And I think there's even a precedent for that. Like, how many young Americans, I guess, uh, of my age, I'm still young, um, how many people like my age would have said, that, like, oh, yeah, I got my news back in the day from The Daily Show, right? Which is like a comedy show. Yeah, uh, for really, sure, like, for sure. Online memes, yeah. Um, so I feel like there a lot more of that is kind of happening, um, where people are online, they're getting their information from online, they're getting their news from online, and then they're amplifying stuff online. Um, that's the first part. So that's why I'm kind of addressing a lot of the stuff that goes on in that realm, because I see a lot of it bleeding over in the real world. The second part is when you talk about, like, who should be canceled for saying, you know, certain things. If you want to go online and you want to say things like, I hate black people and stuff, I think that's totally fair to, to like, for people to, to blow back against you. Like, you should. The issue that I have is it starts to get a lot more subtle. Like, you brought up the dog whistling thing. Uh, I don't know if we talk about dog whistling as much. Much, but I remember there was a period in time where it was like an online scavenger hunt to try to find anybody that made the OK symbol. And if you found them ever doing it anywhere, it meant they were like a closet secret Nazi and people were trying to find out like any piece of information about them to like shut them down from their jobs, get them kicked out of whatever. And a lot of people were just doing it because of like either dumb meme shit or they just like naturally did it. There was a, I think a staffer in Congress that people were trying to say was like giving secret Nazi salutes like on camera, which she was probably just like making a symbol or whatever. Um, 
so yeah, those are kind of like so two areas. So one is that the online stuff has gotten a lot more no, into I agree. The real life, and I agree. two is that yeah, the the canceling like people can try to cancel like Kanye West over saying some crazy shit, which I agree with. But like for normal citizens, if somebody's starting to say some weird stuff, I think we should be able to engage them in conversation, try to pull them back from the brink, rather than cutting them off as soon as they're kind of like leaving the mainstream. Uh, I guess like progressive opinion. I, I guess where I'm confused is like, what do you mean by canceling someone and take like? If anyone out here wants to say some some crazy racist stuff, mm-hmm. I'm not going to be like, "Hey, you're not allowed to be around me. I'm going to fucking kill you." If they're open to engaging in a conversation, the mm-hmm. issue is a lot of these people who say this stuff, they're not interested in conversations. They're not interested in engaging. A lot of it is them trying to sway people to their opinion as subtly as possible that I don't like minorities. I don't like women. I don't like, you know, uh, L- the LGBTQ plus community, mm-hmm. and I don't see a problem with telling those people, "Yo, shut the f- up!" Like, because so, you don't have any interest in actually engaging in a debate. Mm-hmm. What you're interested in is getting those like moderate people that mm-hmm. claim they're moderate who have their minds uh, easily manipulated by contrarian opinions, things like that. And they just want to bring those people further and further to their side. And I don't see a problem with telling those people, yo, get the fuck out of my space. Like, you, there's no reason to let you say this vitriolic bullshit because you don't actually, some of them don't even believe that shit. Like, they're just saying it because they want more power or means or access. Like, they, they see it as these, I'm kind of wavering a, po- a bit, but they see it as like a... A cultural lightning rod, sure. right? That is just going to yeah. And I, I agree with you. There are base. some of the people that are having the conversations are so ridiculous, and they seem like impervious to like fact or argument. I do agree with that to some extent that these people do exist. The people that are willing to do the debates and the people that are kind of at the top of these are definitely like that. But I think a lot of their followers like genuinely do believe the stuff. Like they're not just grifting, they're not just saying whatever. They genuinely do get like taken in by it and they start to believe it. And then moderates or people in the center will start to get taken in by it. And the thing that is scary to me is as somebody that I try to engage anybody that I can with differing political opinions is when somebody, a moderate, goes into a space and they see that on one side, somebody's saying like, you we don't talk about these opinions we don't do that they're hateful and the other side is saying well we'll talk about anything you want to talk about i think that the moderate looks at the person over there and like well this guy seems way more reasonable these people are denying the ability to even have the conversation these people are willing to talk about anything and it it creates this kind of like weird pipeline to where people are being funneled over into these like kind of conservative spaces because the conservatives seem more willing to have the conversations than the progressives are see like i think that largely explains the success of people like jordan peterson or andrew tate because you've got people that are willing to address like a group of like young white men that the left-leaning media has kind of like demonized over and over again and has made it socially acceptable to attack so are you saying it's it's not socially acceptable to attack people who say things like, I hate women, or I well, hate... Well, the thing I'm is, like, I don't think people usually say, like, I hate women. They'll say things I, like, I, I think women are different than men and shouldn't have the same jobs. They'll say stuff like that. I, I, I agree with that, but they say those things with the purpose of kind of subliminally painting those those messages of, hey... Yeah, men and women are different because men are better than women. Or blacks might, and whites are different because white people are better than black people. But do you think there could be some people that say that, where it doesn't come from a place of hatred, it just comes from a place of observation? Like, somebody might say, well, I, men and women nah, are No, I think different. it comes from a, a place of ignorance. Not hatred or observation. I think it comes from ignorance. And you argue, like, men and women are different, right? Or do you, do yeah, you for, so? for yeah. sure, for so, sure, like, for sure. Somebody could make that observation, and then they might see a conservative that says men and women are different, therefore men are better than women. But they'll see a progressive say, well, men and women aren't, aren't different at all. Well, aren't well, they more how, likely to listen to the how many just he's how many progressives do you see mm-hmm. saying men and women aren't different at all? Like, well, I mean, I think arguably over like. It gets a little bit more into the weeds, but like on the trans stuff, for instance, um, there's a lot of arguments that like, well, if you're on HRT for one year, you're essentially the same as whatever gender you've, um, you know, started to take HRT or TRT. I mean, but if we're talking about the trans population, that's like less less than one percent of the population, right? Yeah, but for a while it dominated like 85 percent of the media cycle, right? And and why do you think that is? (laughs) Um, I think there's two reasons. I think one is because conservatives are looking for lightning rod issues that they can do exactly over. But two, it's because progressives get baited into defending really stupid positions and won't just like give ground in areas where oh they yeah should. I, I think there is a lot of anger within the progressive movement and i think the issue is it's justifiable anger like for decades we've had so many conservative voices saying these hateful hateful things 
And the second that progressives start pushing back, it's like, oh, my God, you're unreasonable. How dare you say these things? Look, you're trying to cancel me. And it's like, no, we're not trying to cancel you. We're just pissed. Like, how, how, how are we supposed to just sit there and take it when people are saying, hey, every single brown person is illegal. Hey, every single black person's a criminal. Hey, every single uh, trans person is a groomer. Mm-hmm. Like, nah. It wh- might be like... This might be like an ideal, uh, an idealist position to have, um, but like I guess the hope would be that you, we could be better than the opposition. That like if, if you if you have people that are incredibly hateful in the rhetoric, the counter to that isn't to be like incredibly hateful back, but the idea is that like okay, well we're going to engage with the ideas and we're going to do our thing instead of like um, pushing like so hardcore on the other side that you have things like people justifying like the BLM riots, where they'll say stuff like, well you know people are rioting and it's understandable because of all the anger that they suffered. And it's like okay, well now you've got all these communities that now are even more incensed against BLM. Like we saw support for BLM massively drop off once the rioting started, and it's like well fuck, well what do we actually accomplish at the end of the day? Like they were angry, they did dumb shit. The conservatives which they have i agree with you but now we got angry and then we did dumb shit and now like everybody's back at at, at ground zero and i'll give you the last word on that for the response go for it so are you saying uh i I know you said i I get the last word but but yeah go (sighs) i i do think there is a time and a place to respond with anger towards hate i do think there is a time and a place to look at people who say terrible stuff and tell them hey shut up and i don't think there's anything wrong with that like i'm i'm gonna i'm gonna pull the hitler card right like if someone day one a one from day one hitler's out there saying i hate jews and someone shoots hitler the second he says that shit i don't think that's a bad thing like if like I don't see how that is a terrible thing. If someone's out there and saying, I, trans people should be genocided, and you shoot that person, and you take that person off the face of the earth, I don't think that's inherently a bad thing. Okay, well, I I, obviously I completely disagree, but uh, thanks for the chat. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming up and disagreeing. I appreciate it. Uh, I'm Atanu. Wait, what'd you say? Atanu. Atanyo. Atanu. Atadu. Yes. Okay. How's it going? Great. Um, I just wanted to clarify, but you think that there is progressive movements that are worth, like, pursuing? Yeah, right? I think that progressive policies are things that I yeah. generally agree with. Yeah, I'm a, like, I would say I'm a progressive. So, yeah. so wouldn't you say that, like, the overall, like, woke movement has progressed that significantly, at least in, like, last 10 years or so? A bit, yeah, but I'm worried about, like, a snap back because of the unwillingness to engage with the other side. So, like, I would say, like, what we saw with Leah Thomas and the national mm. discourse on that represented a snap back. I mean, like, I think when you think about progressive movements historically and recently, that's always been a kind of part of it. That's always been, like, the conservative, like, talking point. They're like, hey, are we going too far? Are we doing too much? Mm -hmm. And then I feel like liberals and progressives have always been carrying too much water on that topic for conservatives. I feel like we shouldn't, we should talk more about the issues and not, like, say, like, hey, guys, we need to chill out. Because, like, if you think about, like, for example, like, BLM more recently, um there's a lot of conservatives going on and talking about how there's too much rioting, there's too much blah, blah, blah. And then, like, I think, like, the number is, like, 93% of all the protests were peaceful. It's like, why, why, as progressives, why do we have to, like, address the worst parts of our movement when we can just push our message? I, no, so this is something that I would agree with. Yeah. But here's the issue that happened. This is what changed. So that's what you just gave was the correct response. A conservative comes up and they say, well, what about BLM? That was super violent. You go, no, it wasn't violent. There, well, yeah. there were aspects of violence to it, mm-hmm. but I disavow that. I don't agree yeah. with that. Um, most of it was peaceful. We should mm-hmm. push for the peaceful stuff and disavow the violent stuff. The issue is when the majority of progressives started to defend the violence. And I think that's when stuff started to get like really wacky because you started, rather than saying like, yeah, there was some rioting, we don't support mm-hmm. that, that's not good. You started getting people saying things like, well, you know, they were rioting against the capitalist establishment that's part of the oppressive system that is keeping minorities down, and that's why we have to Mm -hmm. burn down, like, neighborhoods and city blocks. And it's like, well, now we're in a totally different world where it's not just, like, you're defining, you know, the types of stuff that we have to talk about. We're defining it by defending it. I mean, I I think think that's always going to happen, though. I I think it's worth moving on to different topics or defending the thing that we're trying to defend without like giving that much too much like attention like um because i i don't think like the it's a vocal minority of progressives that like push this message i think you said earlier uh today that like 
a, a tweet with like four retweets or likes will get like 20 million views on like a YouTube video. It's like yeah. why? Well, why? it used to, but now I feel like it's different. Like. It used to be the case that Twitter was a place where we just kind of ignored people because mm-hmm. they were crazy and we knew they were crazy. But like in the 2016 election cycle, Bernie mm-hmm. Sanders had to like disavow the people on Twitter that were like militant in favor of him. Like he had to actually come out on stage and be like, I don't support any of this stuff. Um, and then you're starting to see more and more vocal support for mm-hmm. what I would argue are like movements that go too far or at least protests that go too far. Like there, it should, we should unequivocally disavow writing. It's the easiest thing in the world to yeah, do. I, I With agree. some yeah. limited exception. You know, if you want to write against like certain public buildings, like sure. But when we're talking about like burning down car dealerships, and stuff, that's like the easiest disavowal in the world. Yeah. And when it's reached the point to where you've got like pictures of CNN journalists, you know, saying like, oh, here we are, the mostly peaceful protest, and it's like a car dealership on fire in the background, you're, it's like the freest ammunition in the world mm-hmm. to give to like this conservative side of people that are like trying to claim everybody's violence. Yeah, you know? I, I do think that like liberals and progressives have been historically bad at pushing their narratives and their whatever they want to push, but like, I, I, I do think that like. It's it's we we like the average person doesn't have like I guess like more specifically to the topic anti wokeism I don't think we have the media literacy to understand for like for example if you were Crowder coming onto UT campus and I was like a dumb UT student mm-hmm. like I, like most people will get like farmed in that instance they would like look bad yeah versus so like like canceling these people or preventing them from showing up and pushing their message when most people don't have the ability to like push back. I think that does more good than it does harm. So here's the issue that I have. I think that if Crowder shows up at a college campus and Mm -hmm. makes college kids look bad, college campuses are the perfect place for that to happen. Because if somebody presents you with an idea that you don't know how to deal with on a college campus, you have communities, you've got teachers, you've got resources to figure out, well, how do I navigate these conversations? Some guy came up and he gave somehow a really compelling argument for like Nazism or something. I didn't really know what to say. I didn't have the historical background. I didn't have like the policy governmental background. I didn't have like even the moral or ethical background. I know what to do, but I've got this whole host of resources on this college campus that I can like have conversations with to flesh out like, well, this is what you could have said or this is how you deal with that. As opposed to what seems to happen is is people go to college, they hear one message the whole time, they don't really get any diversity of thought, then they graduate, then they're in the workplace, and then they stumble onto like these crazy f-ing YouTube channels, and now they're like, well, hold on, this guy is saying some crazy true shit, and I've never heard a counter to any of these ideas before, maybe there's some truth to this, and now who do you have to talk to to like try to figure out if they're good or bad ideas? Your friends? You've got like the comment section on videos? Like, at that point, you're like doomed, you know? But, That's why I feel like college is like this last bastion of area where you can have like really aggressive conversations, but then have a community afterwards to go into and then to figure out like well, what's the best way to navigate it. I, I do appreciate the idea of that that like you get challenged in like the marketplace of ideas and then you go and like learn from it but like it, it, there's two things it's like first of all that's assuming that that kid would go from that conversation and then want to learn from it instead of just being like butthurt and doing nothing about it that's like one that's one big part and the second thing is for every kid that like learns from this instance from like facing it there's like a million people watching Crowder's videos and learning the opposite it's like oh look at this like kid he got like owned on YouTube right it's like those videos in like 2016 2015 created a whole generation of like conservative people like yeah but I feel like the reason why they created that generation is because like Crowder largely seems to go unchallenged at these college campuses. Like, people don't know the response to, like, pretty basic questions. Like, if you feel strongly... I, I, I don't think that's going to change, though. You I, don't I, think people can be educated to, like, have good responses to, like, the... Cra- I, I think the, the design of those kind of conversations when, like, people come onto campuses and give talks, they, they aren't going to face any kind of... No matter, like, what happens, aren't going to face any kind of, like, real pushback. So and then, what, about, so then what like, about kids that have graduated college? Like, how do you de- how do they deal with, like, YouTube videos and stuff? Are they just lost at sea, or...? I mean, like, every... every no, I, I mean, I'm pretty black-pilled on this. I think most people are not going to have the media literacy to understand... So then do we, like, ban it all off YouTube as well, or...? No, it's just... I'm not saying ban it off of YouTube, but I'm saying that, like, when people take these measures to prevent these kind of conversations, I'm not opposed. Because I know the result of those conversations is more harm than good. Isn't it, isn't like the kind of the goal of democracy that we ought to be able to have challenging conversations? Like, isn't that part of the responsibility we have as citizens to our government, to our people, to be able to have challenging conversations with opposing I, points I, of I view? Do, I do think that there are places for that. Like, for example, like, uh, policy debates when people go on, like, radio shows or, like, mm-hmm. um, they, they bring on... Speci- I, I know, like, NPR does, like, a radio show where they bring on two experts on a conversation and they ask, like, a, sure. uh, uh, an audience, like, uh, how do you feel about this before and after, right? I feel like that's more of a controlled environment. 
where you have people who have the ability to combat each other mm -hmm. or like political debates like when presidential debates like uh, governor debates these kind of areas where you have people who have the training to combat each other and post their ideas versus like when you come onto a campus and like these these people have a uh, uh, like weeks of training on how to own like 18 year olds. It's like yeah, but that, it's not even usually weeks of training. It's like it's like the American college student is like one of the most educated like people like in all of history. Like we do so much schooling here. We've got in America especially, you're forced to take like you've got your um, your gen eds. Like mm -hmm. you've got to take like a whole like and the whole point is to like round you out more as a college student. I don't even think in Europe. I don't think they force like gen eds as much as you in the United States. I feel like you should be able to have. I mean, I, like, I, I it's, agree. It's scary I, I, to me they did like, well, there's a Nazi on campus and nobody knows how to talk to him. Like, it should be pretty easy to tell a Nazi, like, well, this is why Nazism is a really dumb idea. This is why liberalism I mean, or something like, is better. Like, like, there, there isn't like Nazis on campus straight up saying Nazi stuff. There's like people like Crowder saying like, oh, I think there's like differences between like the races. And then like, nobody knows how to handle that yeah, but and I they? wish I wish they did then that, we should do that I, I right feel like that's very idealized but yeah versus, but this is what we're at college this is a place for ideals right don't you all like, have dreams like, and you like, guys aren't old enough to have your hopes and dreams crushed yet you should still be idealistic right but then we can look at the results we can see generations of generations of like kids just like being red pilled to like yeah but like I think I feel like it's because progressives don't try mm -hmm. this is something that like and I I used to like four years ago I was 100 percent on your point of view like some things you just can't debate certain people because they're bad faith they mm -hmm. dance around too much or slippery blah 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 but then as I look more and more around different types of people and I've communicated with so many different types of people what I've realized is that I think you can communicate a lot of ideas to a lot of people but a lot of people on the left just don't even want to try they give up before they've even started like yeah, some guy I, will show I, up I and be like that's... oh black people are warriors and white people are more smart and the guy will like give up immediately it's like oh okay well you got me and it's like that's that's it really you're not even gonna try to have that conversation but it's like, I, I think I think that the fact that you saying that like people aren't willing to try isn't gonna change I feel like that's just a constant people are I gonna feel be like that's set a social, in their way I feel like it's a social experience. I feel like we can change it. I think that can change. Like, I think it's if somebody like, listens to me, they're more likely to do it. If more people, like, kind of spread that mm -hmm. idea that, like, if Crowder's here, there should be, like, a well-informed base of college students where like, when he says can, some crazy shit, you can push we, we back can, on we it. We can kind of, like, look at, like, some something more recent. Like, we've seen people like Fuentes or, like, Trump get banned off of, like, social media, right? Yeah. And now you don't see as much people talking about, like, the crazy shit that Trump and Fuentes say, mm -hmm. right? It's like, it's like, at the same time, it's like, I, I, I used to be the opposite. I used to feel like, oh, yeah, we should have every idea, bad or good, on the marketplace, and then people should debate it. And bad ideas will fall to the bottom, good ideas will come to the top. But instead, we had like four years of like half the population of America and that's, parodying but that's, what Trump said on Twitter. Yeah, right? but I think that's the issue is you can cancel people. Yeah. <laughs> but ideas are bulletproof. You ever seen V for Vendetta? Um, no, but like I think you can cancel the you can cancel a person, but you can't like get rid of the ideas. And I think that's the issue is that um, that I that my big wake up moment for that was Trump being elected. When Trump was running for office, it was so obvious that he had no chance of ever being elected. He just couldn't. His rhetoric was too extreme. Some of the stuff he said was crazy. Even for Republicans, some of the stuff he said was too crazy. Him winning the election was like holy shit. There are so many people in this country that believe things that I wasn't even aware of. Yeah, I thought but, we were past all of that. If you want to talk about Trump, it's like he spouted. He, he was obviously given like the biggest platform in the world being the United States president right but, sure, but let's say like somehow he's prevented of that mm -hmm. there was like a market uptick of violence against minorities and this you had the Charleston uh, incident right like that happened more or less because Trump was given like a platform to talk about his stuff right it's like specific people do matter. yeah but again specific now what do you people saying, like, are we, very but the goal and so on one end we can either confront these ideas head-on and try to get people like on our side mm -hmm. or on the other hand we can just kind of try to get deep platform deep platform ban Trump ban Trump ban the next guy ban Andrew Tate ban every new per ban sneak open like every mm -hmm. new person that comes up like obviously the current of idea is still there banning mm -hmm. the people isn't getting rid of it because some of these people are exploding but, but you can and, see that there was a huge difference of Trump getting a platform like there before, was but like although like, Republicans aren't gone they still they, have they those gone, thoughts they were like why? Biden is still at risk in this election it's no, not like I, oh I thank agree, god I agree, we banned Trump right I agree. and they're, like DeSantis all, is incredibly popular so my point is that there's always going to be people who believe X or Y right but like people are more afraid to dis, uh, disclose that they're into Y if X is on top right sure but isn't so, that like part of the issue because I don't if, want somebody that's you, if me yeah. and you agree that like Y is bad then and if our end goal is that we shouldn't have why which is charleston riots right like we shouldn't have like that kind of stuff happen then we shouldn't allow for those kind of people to talk okay because like like okay so i'll give you the i'll or i'll respond i'll give you the final word on it 
I want to be allowed to talk, and I think that progressives with radical ideas should be allowed to talk, mm -hmm. even if a lot of people find them offensive. Um, I think there's a valuable conversation to be had there. But I think if we're going to let one side talk, we're going to let the other side it has to talk too. I think that if we're going to live in a democracy, and if we believe in like democratic ideals, I think we kind of have to trust. There's a, like one of the risks of democracy is you're, it's, you're you're putting a lot of trust in normal people. Like a normal U.S. citizen is going to the ballot box, and they're deciding if we're going to have drones in Yemen. They're deciding how we're going to regulate social media. They're like when we vote for elected officials, all of this stuff is at risk when we're casting a ballot. And is insofar as we're going to trust an American citizen to make that decision, I think we ought to be engaging them in conversations and treating them like people that are intelligent enough intelligent enough to come to like informed decisions about these things otherwise i mean like all is lost we're basically ceding all these platforms to whoever wants to be the most ideologically driven warrior who's going to like lead everybody because nobody else is having the conversations that's my fear mm -hmm. and then i'll give you the last word on it go for it um i want to start this by saying that i do agree that a lot of people catch strays when it comes to this movement. A lot of people who shouldn't be canceled get canceled. Even even your Twitch ban I disagree with. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but I do think the overall progress that this woke movement has made has been drastic. Like even like like 15 years ago like gay marriage was not legal in America, right? Like mm -hmm. versus the discord right discourse right now it's like unbelievable for someone on a public platform to talk against gay people right mm -hmm. so like you you see these kind of like huge steps that we've taken in a very quick fashion probably due to the internet and this ability to uh project these kind of ideas and but that kind of i i don't think we should like hold so much water for the conservative idea that like wokeness has gone too far when you we see these large swaths of progress that we've made in a very short amount of time like personally what i believe to be progress okay i appreciate the conversation thank you uh david david um i think like the problem is is that i think like this premise kind of sucks because okay. i think normally when you're putting up like a debate topic usually it's like a principled position you can argue for or against like if that were um if that like structure were imposed on this debate it would be like is wokeness good or is wokeness bad whenever you go like on this question of um has wokeness gone too far it's like it seems like it's implicit that wokeness can be a good thing but like this is too much of a good thing it's like a question of like a threshold right where at a certain point wokeness is good but when it goes too far that's like the threshold that has been crossed and then it's a problem right yeah i mean but that's i guess essentially my argument like uh in terms of policy positions like i agree with most woke things i think um my issue was just like this the rigid social enforcement of like progressive ideas and then the like expulsion of everybody out of communities that doesn't like adhere to this really rigidly defined system is essentially my problem but right. like i'm not going to say that like wokeness is bad or all woke things are bad or whatever it's just kind of like the woke culture and like the very purely driven like internally reinforced culture that's developed out of it i think has gone a little bit too far it's too much so but like when i say too far like if you've got a guy that is like in a group of friends who like calls people the n-word all day and you're like we're not talking to you anymore because that's cringe now yeah. that's cool that's based but if you got a guy who's like um i don't know if i feel like cultural appropriation is a big deal and you're like okay well we're gonna put you on twitter and ruin your life that's probably too far yeah but yeah. both are like a form of like wokeness i guess but yeah um like would you say that like you have your, your principal objection to like the current way that this is handled is like ethical or like in terms of like effectiveness because i don't really have like the data to support this but um, I think when you look at like certain people who I feel like are causing like active harm, um, like I think you know Andrew Tate's a great example, um, especially because it feels like, and I don't I don't have like the data to support this. It feels like when he got deplatformed from all of these different places, you saw his um, rhetoric like way less. So if you feel like his rhetoric is coming harm, if he's deplatformed, then you could say that that's like effectively a good thing. But would you still say that that's ethically a bad thing? Um, I would say it's ethically and practically a bad thing. So, the, Republicans do this on their side. Progressives do this on, here, on their side. Okay, so here's an issue that I have, okay? Let's say we've got some people commit too much crime. Right. Say poor people commit too much crime, okay? There's two ways to look at this. I would argue the conservative way is like, make it more illegal. Make it more punishments, you know, fuck these people committing crime. Hmm. Then the progressive side will look at it and they'll go, okay, well, hold on. This is a really one-dimensional view of crime. People don't just commit crime because they want to commit crime. There's all of these extenuating factors, all of these environmental reasons why if you put a person in a certain area, they're more conditioned to uh, commit certain types of crime, right? right? Which is probably a better way of looking at things. 
But then when progressives look at social media, they'll see like somebody like Andrew Tate, and they'll go like, oh my god, Andrew Tate, popular guy, misogynistic, perma ban on everything. Boom, we fixed it. And it's like, right. well, no, hold on. The problem isn't Andrew Tate. Andrew Tate, did this guy even exist online like a year and a half ago? Uh, it feels like his whole thing was like this big, crazy. Well, I think this is the problem, right? Is like he came out of like nowhere and he like exploded. But like exactly, issue, it's That's not like it's not like everybody was like super chill and cool. And then fuck, Andrew Tate just came out of nowhere and boom, turned everybody like red pill, misogynist, blah blah blah. It seemed like that like undercurrent of thought was there waiting for somebody to show up and be like oh that's our guy now and now that Andrew Tate's gone my prediction for the future be there's going to be another guy that's going to pop up because you haven't actually addressed any of ideas or addressed any of the issues that like caused him to become as popular as he was you just ban that particular person and you're hoping that another person doesn't come up that's like him in the future yeah but like I feel like that's kind of the problem right the fact that he could explode so fast because like what was responsible for that was the fact that he really zeroed in on, on this really really effective scheme of making himself more popular and disseminating his ideas because he would have like this weird like pyramid scheme of content creation where he could pay people to put him on TikTok, put him on YouTube and just flood the internet with his name. And so I feel like the fact that somebody can do that, it's less about the ideas at that point and it's more about the mechanisms of these social media websites that can allow for people to take control of them and just like explode their ideas. Sure, but there's a lot of people that could do the same thing Andrew Tate did and not get any popularity at all. Like, at the end of the day, he had a good scheme for paying people and getting people to post his clips online, mm. but they only got popular because the, there was somebody that wanted to hear that message that he was giving. Right. And I think that, like, it's not like Andrew Tate came out of nowhere. Like, him personally, he came out of nowhere. But, like, we've had red pill movements online, you know, since the, the early 2010s, right? Yeah, you had the course. early, like, pickup artist, MGTOW community. You've had the growing, like, red pill, black pill community. Now you've got, like, this, like, the, the, the whatever the new generation or iteration of red pill community under like uh, Tate this like quasi Christian quasi traditional values but also weirdly misogynist just like whatever like you, you've got this like new like Tate esque stuff um, mm -hmm. it's it's been growing it's been like under there waiting for people to come up and like take advantage of it and I don't feel like any progressive or liberal response has ever been mounted against it. Like, like a conservative, here's the thing, if I was a conservative, okay, I would ask a progressive, okay, you want to ban Andrew Tate, you want to get rid of, like, Jordan Peterson, you want to get rid of these guys, who are your male role, model, role, male role models on the progressive side that are speaking to, like, disaffected young men? Yeah, I mean, that, that is a good question. But, like, I think the thing that I want to get back to is, like, obviously nobody's going to disagree that misogyny has always existed and that, like, these communities have always existed. The question is, did, was Andrew Andrew Tate responsible for the growth of these ideas, especially in younger demographics, because you would see all these accounts of like teachers and like high schools and even middle schools being like, well, all my students are talking about Andrew Tate. He's like their favorite guy ever. He's like their role model. And so it's less about the fact that, oh, misogyny's always existed. So Andrew Tate's like not that big of a deal. I don't want to like start my vision or anything, yeah, yeah. but like, you know, I think the bigger problem is the growth and the dissemination of his ideals. The fact that, you know, he is so popular on platforms that are that are popular amongst like young people it's less about like the ideas and whether or not they exist and like it's it's way less about debating the like value of these ideas it's more about like the volume and the presence of these ideas amongst demographics yeah i guess the issue is that like I, he probably moved the needle a little bit but i i think that he's speaking to people that are they want to hear the message because they're not getting anything on the other side like i'm gonna i never do this people i'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit okay, okay. understanding it's hard to do this sure but like so here's a question, okay? Andrew Tate got deleted off the internet. Sure. Like 20 social media platforms all banned him simultaneously. Yeah. Why? I mean, that, that is like a good question. <laughs> I think... I mean, like, this is the so problem. Th this no, is, no, this no, is no, troubling this is... to me because, like, this guy got deleted. More than Trump got banned off the no, internet. No, no, I, and I, we don't I, even know why he was banned, I do have an know? answer, and this is why I probably would agree with you. I mm -hmm. think the problem is, is that um, all social media platforms have really, really interpretive TOSs, and so like, but this isn't you about really TOS. This is about like, this is about the woke idea. It's about the rigid enforcement of kind of like the progressive orthodoxy. That like the reason why Tate was banned was because he was giving opinions about like misogyny and stuff that kind of fell outside of what is like the socially acceptable left leaning kind of like orthodoxy view on. I guess gender norms or whatever and so he got like completely bucked and destroyed by the system just gone yeah. because like if I ask like because when, when somebody tells me oh this guy got banned from Facebook uh, TikTok Twitch Instagram everything I'm thinking like okay this dude is either a terrorist mass murderer convicted multiple rapists but it's like well no he just like people said he was misogynistic I guess but it's like well, yeah, that's really it's, troubling to me I, like, I think the thing is is like I think it's this is an, this is an impossible to question answer I mean impossible to answer question because like 
we don't know what the thought process was of the people in the room making these decisions. And at some point, it kind of veers into conspiracy because none of us are flies in the wall, like in the board of directors room for like Facebook or like in these rooms for like TikTok or whatever. We don't know what their rationale is. We don't know what their thought process was. It's sure, totally but we do know there to was. Us. It is a, to, to use the technical term, it was a conspiracy and that there was a plan by multiple people to get him off the internet, right? Like it, it's not like unless he happened to just break the TOS on like six different social media platforms at the same time, that's probably not the case. Like there was like a, like, okay, well, this guy's got to go. And then everybody's like, okay, well, we're banning him, we're banning him, we're banning him. Now maybe they yeah, didn't all plan it, but, but they saw one platform do it and everybody's like, okay, well, fuck, we got to follow suit. Yeah. Which is, I think, almost just as scary. But I was going to say, because I think that's like a real capitalist thing where when you have PR image, like when you have like a PR image for your company, like... You don't want to be the one platform that doesn't well, ban this, Andrew Tate. This, <laughs> was, this, this just happened with Hockey Canada, right? Because Hockey Canada had a bunch of like these sexual assault allegations. And when one sponsor pulls out, then the five left are like, oh, this looks bad. Then another one drops out. Oh, now there's four left. And it's like, well, this looks terrible for us. Sure. So I think it's more of like a PR thing. Once one drops them and you don't know why they dropped them, the rest of them might just fall in line because because of like a, of like a, a purely cynical corporate decision. That is true, but my guess would be I'm going to totally make this up. But if I could find a way to pull all progressives on college campuses, my guess would be over 70% think that Tate should be perma banned from all social media. Without knowing why he's even banned, that'd be my guess. Yeah, but I, I, at that point, I, I, I don't know. Like you have to actually pull them because I don't sure, know. Sure, but numbers. I yeah. um, Okay, I'll give you the last word on this topic. Go. Um, I got nothing. I think we had a good conversation. Okay, so. well, hey, I appreciate it, man. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah, have a good one.